feels like Christmas Eve without the Christmas carols. <laughs> and I could just see the chairman of the board rubbing his hands. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us continue to worship God. God of grace, you have given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. Fill us with your spirit that we may celebrate your glory and worship you in spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say. of reading is Psalm 32, verses 6 to the end of the psalm. The refrain will be refrain number 2, and Douglas Haas will play the melody. It's not known to you. And then the choir will sing it, and you'll join in. faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you.
from the fifth chapter of the book of Joshua, reading verses 9 to 12. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land. The Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year.
from the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, starting at 11, verse 11. Then Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, this younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. There he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have had bread enough to spare? Here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion. He ran, and he threw his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Here endeth the reading of the lesson. May the Lord add his blessing unto this, the reading of his own holy word. And to his name be all the honor and the glory. Amen. Let us all bow our heads in prayer. Bracing ourselves for another week, we come searching for someone who can be our companion and strength through it all. This morning, we hoped we would find here a word that we ease us back into life tomorrow morning, back to the things we dread, back to the demands and claims upon our lives of our jobs. This morning, we hoped that we would find people who cared enough just to stand by us, people who understand, because that's what we need, someone who understands. This morning, we wait for one who knows what it is deep within us which is aching, who knows the void, who understands the pain. 
This morning, we look for encouragement. Help us to rearrange our life. Help us to confront the things about our lives which are threatening us. Help us to face the truth head on, only to discover that the truth is merciful. Help us to lay it all out on the table where we can look at it and look at you and say, O Lord, forgive. Release us from all that binds us that we might be free to soar to the great heights of our lives. Release us from the things that hold us back from giving to you and to those around us our best. Release us from a past so that we can be free for today. Confirm every quiet resolve this morning. What new beginnings are being undertaken in this hour of worship? What decisions which turn lives around? What courage is being grasped to do the very things we are doing? Sustain those people who are launching out into the deep. Affirm them who take their first tentative steps toward the living of their own lives. Strengthen those who bear intolerable burdens and do so without complaining. Encourage those who have a long road to recovery and renewal ahead and give hope to those who feel that today there is not much to live for. This morning, help us to embrace one another in peace and in hope. Let our love reach out across barriers which before have seemed so vast. Let our prayers touch those in hospitals, in nursing homes, in unemployment lines and in soup kitchens, those in despair and in pain. In these moments, in the quietness of this place, we remember those who need you most this morning. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. 
Now I'm going to do something that is going to make a lot of people in this congregation very happy. For 34 years, you have said, would you stop reading those endless announcements up there and just let us read the bulletin? You got it. And now as God has prospered us, may we return to him what is his very own. Quite a while ago, I began the thought process for this event this morning, and the first question that came to mind is, what will I do? I have a pretty good idea what I don't want to do. I don't want to preach one of those if I only had one sermon to preach things, which would pretty much mean dumping the whole load on you the last go-around. If I haven't said it in 34 years, what might prompt me to say it today? So you're not getting that. And I don't want to do an award show closing where I thank everything from the hymn writers to my great-grandfather who had the nerve and the fire in him to launch a lawsuit against a session for wrongful dismissal. You got off light with me. 
One thing I've always wanted to do is step up into the pulpit and say to you, I had a long, hard week. I've worked 70 hours. I've been interrupted so many times that I haven't had a moment to do anything worthwhile with a sermon. So sorry, but I have nothing to say this morning and go and sit down. <laughs> and we plotted this with some of the members of the congregation when we were at Christy Todd's uh, graduation. We were having dinner before her, her graduation and with, I was gonna have a group in the gallery who were gonna blow bubbles as I went back and sat down. The point of it, I don't know, but they chickened out and so did I. Keep it light, I said to myself. Remind them of the times when stranger than strange things have happened around here. Like the evening service back in about 1975 when I stood up to preach and a sharp crack of lightning and thunder certainly let the folks know that they were to listen up. <laughs> then the hydro went off and the place was plunged into total darkness and they figured this was going to be the sermon of the millennium. Well, I did keep talking because it was very dark in here so that people would not get panicky and it was before the days of those security lights that come on. Then the lights came back on and they got the whole load and they really, really listened. Or the Sunday morning when the TV crew came to my office and said with wide eyes, there's a squirrel up in the gallery. <laughs> After making the announcement, he stood there and I said as authoritatively as I could, get rid of it. <laughs> Finally, after about a half an hour with frequent journeys by Donald to my office to report on its progress, they reported back with pride that they had exhausted the poor thing so much that they were able to pick it up and carry it out, and both they and the squirrel were relieved the whole thing was over. And the Sunday morning not too long ago when I got through a sermon, and from 9.30 to 11 the pages got out of order, and you'll remember this. And I told the story at that time, and I think it's worth retelling, about George Goth, who was preaching on Adam and Eve in the garden. And the sermon was flowing along marvelously, and as he came to the bottom of a page, he had built into the sermon the point in which Adam and Eve had eaten the forbidden fruit. And his text read, and Adam looked at Eve. <laughs> and Adam looked at Eve. <laughs> Seems to be a leaf missing. And I didn't put vodka in this this morning. <laughs> One story that very few of you know about, and now today I feel safe in telling you about it because the session can't get their hands on me anymore, was the wedding when a dog was the ring bearer. <laughs> a beautiful, docile, golden retriever had the rings for the wedding tied to a neckerchief around his neck and he paraded at exactly the right place down the aisle where the best man relieved him of his burden. He was then supposed to leave the church escorted out by his handler. But the bride, whom I feel safe in saying probably is not here this morning, was one of those people who wanted her way in every way, and the dog remained at the front of the church throughout the service. Just one of the many stories I could tell of the 1161 weddings I have done. When I said earlier about standing up without anything to say, that really nearly happened once. It was 1975, it was early spring, when we started to do the two different sermons, 9.30 and 11, so that one could be used for summer telecast. It had been a long week. And come Saturday with a blitz of weddings, I didn't get home till 4.30. I still had two sermons for the morning and one sermon for the evening to write. On top of that, I had a mental block. By 10 p.m. I had one half of a sermon done that I hated, and I wasn't happy. The phone rang. Something bad had happened in the congregation, I was called out. I got home about 1 a.m. I sat down and finished that lousy sermon at 2.30. I got up at 6 and started the second, which got finished at 9.15. I can tell you it was not a vintage Sunday. Then there was the summer evening after a special board meeting when there had been some discussion for some time, dragging on, I felt a bit, about selling the Roy Street manse and providing me with a housing allowance that I may go and find my own digs. Nothing much had been decided at that meeting. They were kind of putting it off again. 
Oh, I think they were writing pieces of paper and dotting the I's and crossing the T's, but it wasn't where my patients wanted it. The chairman of the board came over to the house, not to explain that to me, just to come over, and we were sitting in the living room. It was a lovely Sunday evening, or Saturday, sorry, Tuesday evening. My wife was up in Collingwood. We were having a wee bit of a refreshment. Now, what you need to know is that the Roy Street house, beautiful and all as it was, had a whole colony of bats within its walls who kept emerging without warning, despite all our efforts to exterminate them. As we talked, as if on cue, out came the bat, did his laps around the living room. I casually went over to the, door, the cupboard, picked up a tennis racket that the Stewart family had left me for this house, <laughs> and about on the fourth time around, I hit the bat and stunned it and picked it up and put it outside. I was going back in to continue my refreshment and the chairman of the board was going out like a beeline, he was gone. <laughs> I got a call the next day saying they decided to go ahead. <laughs> but the story that is going to stay with me and my staff, I think, for a long time was when Bill Johnson finally decided that his little Honda Civic clinker that he had driven for X million of miles was ready to be traded in. And he got talking to somebody at one of the Honda dealerships, and they were smooth talking cats and they were talking him up to the Accord, which was only a few dollars more than the Civic that he wanted. Well, Bill agonized for days about this dreadful act of self-indulgence. I always thought buying a car could be a kind of a high moment, a, a kind of a time in which you're kind of pleased with what you've accomplished, not a time of profound penitence. And all of us on staff were party to this hand-wringing that went on for a couple of weeks before he could actually say he was going to buy this expensive self-indulgence. On the day he was to take delivery of his new Accord, we got together on the staff, and when he left, we uh, quickly photocopied in blue ink $5 bills, about 500 of them. I know we broke the law, but it was fun anyways. We taped them like footsteps on the floor leading from the door on the outside right through to his office. We put them all up and down the door jam. We put them on the ceiling of his room. We put them all over his desk. We stuffed them inside his books. And then we had right there on the desk, I've got a, a great big black sign that says, woe is me, I have sinned. I am utterly self-indulgent. <laughs> Bill was still finding $5 in books in his books when he returned from Wales four years later. <laughs> it was really a nice car, but I doubt that he ever enjoyed it for a minute. <laughs> it is good to have Bill back as one of a very fine staff with whom I've had the privilege to work over the last few years. And a great thank you to Bill Lamont and John Kurtz and Susan Shane and Bill Johnson and Douglas Haas and Robert Houghton and Andreas Thiel and Stephen Eady and, of course, this magnificent choir and our wonderful chamber orchestra, a dream fulfilled, and John Moses and all the whole bunch of you. It's just wonderful. If there is a text that I've identified with my ministry, it is probably the story we read today, the parable of the prodigal son. More accurately, the parable of the father and two sons. There are so many things in this parable that inform us on life that it is virtually an inexhaustible supply of themes and thoughts, and you could preach a lifetime and never fully exhausted. The, last, the first time you ever sang that old 100th was the night <laughs> that the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario was here at our 125th anniversary. As I'm standing down there waiting for him, my heart was going so hard, I figured, if this is the beginning of an arrest, this isn't fun. <laughs> and I'm struggling with it this morning, the same thing. You are the Lieutenant Governor doing it to me this morning. At any rate, the issue is about freedom and responsibility, and that's big. Family and sibling issues within this text are important. Parenthood, which breaks all convention, is central to this. And overall, it is a good guide to the people of the church. Both the prodigal and the elder brother are examples of church people. There are those who are human and fallible and bent on doing their own thing and pursuing their own dreams only to come a cropper and come stumbling home changed people. 
And there are other elder brothers in the church who can't get over the fact that while they've been there all along, loyal, hardworking, never giving their father a moment's worry, when this scamp comes crawling home, the big fuss is made over him. There is something about our self-righteousness that is unbecoming and demeaning. Something that reminds us that in God's eyes, everything is, everyone is precious. And everyone is special. Finally, it is about the God who embraces and accepts everyone. The hardest thing about being a church member is to see the kind of people they're letting in the doors these days. As has been heard said, they let anyone in here these days, sinners, outcasts, people of varied sexual preferences, wayward teenagers, street kids, ex-cons, anyone. What's the world coming to? The elder brother hates to see this. The wayward kid is glad that there is some part of society that cares and loves and welcomes them to the banquet table of the kingdom. The gospel reminds us that none of us has any claim to perfection or superiority. We are all people who have received grace and grace in abundance. So to see each other as fellow travelers who have been forgiven and given a new life leads us to see the world through different eyes than the world sees it. The worker in the vineyard gets exactly the same wages whether he started in the morning or at night. For God is not giving us not a day's wage, but the gift of life and of hope and of joy and of victory. And then my second theme. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. That has held my task as a minister of this congregation to focus Thus, in what one person has described, the 90s of greed. Our task as a church is to always be out there caring for those who are greed's victims, either by economic fallout or by the public humiliation that they are subjected to by leaders and people of our culture who can only deal with their own insecurities and own weaknesses by trashing others and feeling that they're superior to them. The church doesn't need to look for a mandate. It is there at its door. And I guess, really, I only want to leave you with one thought. Remember the gifts and blessings which distinguish you as a people of St. Andrew's Church. You are a unique people with a gift of a wonderful past and a tremendous future under God's grace. Hold firmly to that thought through good times and bad. There are in this congregation, as there are in every congregation, people who thrive on negativeness who love to find fault, who love to pull things down, who love to see everything that's not working and pay no attention to the things that are beautiful. And some of them call themselves Christians. Your future lies in brushing the negative voices aside and following the God who leads you to new ministries and greater frontiers of love, compassion, caring, justice, and service. The God who loves you and sustains you will be there with you. Watch and pray and listen. You will be blessed beyond measure. Now, I had threatened to do something really silly at the end of the sermon. And after what you've been through, you probably figure he just might do it, but I'm not. There is an old camp song that goes something like this. Oh, you can't go to heaven. And then it goes on in an old Ford car. Because an old Ford car won't go that far. And then you're saying, oh, you can't go to heaven in an old Ford car because an old Ford car won't. I ain't going to grieve my Lord no more. The last verse is, that's all there is. There isn't any more, so please don't ask for another encore because I ain't going to grieve my Lord no more. Now I'm going to sit down.
play some music. Oh, <laughs> 
grace, mercy, and peace from God who created us, God who has come amongst us to redeem us, and God who abides with us by the presence of the Spirit, be with you all and all your loved ones, now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.